You're listening to The Whole Church Podcast. Our efforts to educate and unite the church are made possible thanks to our sponsors on Patreon. Please consider joining them for $3 a month at patreon.com forward slash the whole church podcast, where you'll get access to special content like our Too Long Didn't Listen segment, where we ask our guests to summarize their interview in under 10 seconds. Psalm 104, 24 through 26 from the CSB reads, How countless are your works, Lord, in wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, vast and wide, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships move about, and Leviathan, which you formed to play there. How could meditating on God's creation and his countless works bring the church closer together, Dr. Whitcomb? I think the prayer that Jesus had in John was that the church would be one like he and the Father was one, and uh, that's based on understanding and accepting the truth. And so that's really what our our goal is, is to understand exactly what God wants for us and uh, then obey it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Whole Church Podcast. I am your host today, TJ. Josh was not able to join us. He and his wife had differing opinions on what was going to happen today, which, uh, as a lot of you know, uh, that argument goes to the wife. Uh, I'm here today with Dr. Whitcomb, Dr. David Whitcomb. Welcome. Uh, we're here to talk about his book and a couple other things, a little bit about his father's work, and we're really excited. Uh, if you are a fan of the show, you've been listening for a little while, and you want to talk to us. Uh, we have a Facebook group called The Whole Church Group. Uh, if it's just on Facebook. You can look for it. The link will be in the show notes. And now for Josh's favorite form of unity. Uh, he believes it is impossible to not be in unity when you're being silly. We have our silly question. I'll answer first to give you plenty of time to think. But if you had to compete with a manatee in any aquatic sport, which sport would you choose? Me personally, I'm going to play polo, water polo. Because manatees don't have hands, I think it'll be pretty easy to score against a manatee. Boy, um, yeah, water polo is actually a great answer. And uh, I think that's uh, the first thing that popped in my head as well. Yeah, it would either be water polo or a high dive. I don't think a manatee can climb a ladder very well. So either of those two things I think would be a good answer for this. But to the real show, one thing we found that really helps with church unity is to hear one another's story. Would you mind sharing your testimony with us and our listeners? Be happy to. So I had the uh, privilege of being uh, born into a Christian home, and uh, my father uh, was a, a seminary professor and theologian. We were in a small town in rural Indiana, and uh, so that's where I grew up. Uh, I was surrounded by uh, Christians in the, the town of Winona Lake, only had 3,000 people, and it had a seminary a Bible college, and a publishing company from the Free Methodist. Uh, so everyone was associated with Christianity in some way. When I was about six or seven years old, I remember I, I got in trouble, as uh, kids often do, and I had a talk with my father, and he explained about uh, the penalty for sin from God's standpoint and the need uh, for someone to take the punishment for me since I uh, it was too great and too harsh to ever uh, endure. And he told me about Christ, and it just seemed obvious, and I wanted to accept Christ, and I did. And ever since then, um, I have always been certain that I'm a believer, that I know Christ, I know God. I just, uh, you know, it wasn't a, a miraculous uh, change, uh, but it was a enduring change that's uh, lasted over half a century. And so I'm certain and sure, and I can remember the, the day that that happened. It just seemed so obvious in knowing to, that I was saved. Yeah, those testimonies are important to hear. Everyone gets caught up on the, oh, there was no big transformative. No, most people don't have that. That's what makes those testimonies, you know, makes those people with those testimonies so much money from speaking. It's the story. But most people... Well, a lot of people just have that, you know, I was raised this way, born this way, reaffirmed this way. That's important. 
Uh, so the book you're here to talk about today also tells the story of your father and his contributions to young earth creationism. Would you mind sharing just a snapshot of his story with us here as well? So uh, growing up as a kid in my father's home, I didn't know any different uh, home life because that's the one I had. But people would come up to me all the time and say, hey, David, do you know who your father is? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> like, is that supposed to be a surprise? But as a kid, you don't really recognize what those people meant. And what they meant was that uh, he was seen already as a, an internationally acclaimed scholar and a, and a, a brilliant theologian. And uh, so that, that was really uh, kind of fascinating to me growing up. Of course, I wanted to develop my own life and uh, have my own career, which I did. And uh, But I was always interested in what he uh, has done, and, and he really spent a lot of time while I was growing up, not just me, but me and my, uh, I have uh, two brothers and a sister, and we were taught theology, we were taught the uh, names of all the Hebrew kings, we were taught the Bible backwards and forwards, uh, so we had a very good upbringing, and throughout my life, I also had the privilege of any time I had a perplexing uh, theological question, I could I could uh, talk to him. Yeah. Um, my daughter, Laura, was assigned to interview my father about his activities in World War II and to record it on video. So she went through and started asking him questions. <laughs> We're going, wow, who is this guy? We never heard him talk about this at all. And so uh, that started a, an opportunity for me to go back and start reading about uh, him and to really study his life uh, beginning in Germany, but turns out that uh, he has thousands of students and followers all over the world that were interested in his life beyond that. And so the book really chronicles not only his life from when he was born in 1924, but all the interesting events that shaped world history and shaped him and his thinking and how God prepared him uh, to write the book, The Genesis Flood, that really started the Young Earth Creation movement. And so the book uh, ends in 1961 when the book was published, and the initial reviews came in, and it was just a, uh, an amazing uh, turn of events that occurred since then. Volume two, uh, I'm still working on now, which is really uh, um, less focused on the uh, creation science and more focused on uh, the church and how uh, truth and doctrine are developed and how truth is taught and modeled and, you know, how do you deal with uh, those kinds of situations. So it's a little, uh, it's a little different flavor, but there's so many people interested in his writing of the Genesis flood that uh, I felt that that was uh, the most important thing for me to work on. And I was happy to give him a copy of the manuscript uh, shortly before he died. And he was just overwhelmed and thrilled by it because he felt that uh, his story was of how God can take and use someone uh, to his honor and glory. And that was really what he asked me to focus on. I imagine it was pretty convenient growing up to have a question about your dad and be able to look it up. Well, I guess it was a little harder back then. Looking up, I yeah, just called him up and said, "Dad, you know, uh, what about, you know, um, you know, it wasn't just creation uh, evolution; it was questions about, um, you know, uh, election and di uh, divine sovereignty and free will, and how do you uh, balance those and uh, eschatology and just all kinds of things. So very, yeah. very uh, interesting. And he was always anxious to." And excited to spend time to uh, provide uh, information and discuss things and, and put up with my silly arguments until I came around to thinking biblically. Yeah. Yeah. You just had that like internet level of access to information way before everyone else. Yeah, it was a, it was a great privilege. Yeah. So, so what inspired you to write your book, uh, A Good and Faithful Servant? Well, it was initially uh, just for our family. Uh, we have a long family history that uh, I think is very interesting, going back to the Plymouth Colony in 1629. So I'm a 12th generation American and son of the American Revolution. 
So I wanted to document that and uh, get as much information and memories from uh, our family as I could just for our kids and, and grandchildren. But uh, it turns out my dad kept a diary every day of his life since age 11, 30,000 pages of information. And he kept every letter from his parents, from other people. Everything was organized, just incredibly detailed, very organized. And so that gave me a chance to go back and uh, start sorting all this stuff out. But I found that the context was extremely important as well. So like, you know, he spent a year and a half in Germany. Oh, it was during World War II. And, you know, he was fighting. Absolutely. So, it, you know, sort of the background about what part of the war he was in and what was happening at the bigger level and, you know, fighting in the Battle of the Bulge and sort of the desperate situations and how he responded. So that's all documented in there. And uh, he grew up in China. He was there uh, in the uh, 19. 20, late late twenties, and uh, why was he there as uh, part of an American military family, and why did the Americans have a post in the middle of China, just like the Britons did uh, with Hong Kong, and uh, what was their view of the Chinese, and you know a lot of the conflicts uh, from that. So it sort of paints a background of those types of things. Uh, he was at Princeton uh, for many years, which. Many of the great uh, theologians of the 19th century uh, came from from uh, Princeton, but uh, now instead of being a conservative seminary, it's considered a liberal seminary, and uh, they had a whole group of their faculty get up and leave and start a new seminary right when my father was there. So the controversies going on there and those types of decisions and uh, his involvement in the Princeton Evangelical Fellowship and and what happened to really turn him on and just uh, compel him to understand what he was designed for by God and how he could be effective in his his Christian life and the effect of mentors and the importance of mentors. And uh, he had four people that close mentors of him. He called them his four fathers. So description of his biological father, his uh, spiritual father, his theological father, and his scientific father. And how how did they spend time and effort with him to answer his questions and train him and direct him and encourage him? So all that kind of stuff is in there, and and um, it's uh, weaving into a story that uh, the reviewers have all thought was uh, really amazing, and it's given it a five out of five stars. So apparently it was hit some some uh, some positive chords and really provided. Uh, perspective and encouragement and how to let God use you. Uh, so so what was the most challenging part of writing the book? Because it doesn't sound like it was the information collection. Um, so the biggest problem is I have pretty severe ADHD and dyslexia. So I can't That'll read and write unless I put uh, five cups of coffee in and focus with all my energy. Uh, it gave me a tough childhood because nobody knew what dyslexia was. They just thought I was lazy because I couldn't read or write. And uh, just, you know, I was, uh, as a matter of fact, in junior high school, uh, they uh, felt that I was not college material and should pursue a job as a, a gardener or landscaper. And they wanted to be put me in the mentally retarded classes because uh, I was having a hard time in the bigger classes and taking notes and listening. I just, it was hard. Um, but um, one of the teachers said, you know, he can't be an idiot if he's one of the best ch chess players we have. And perhaps he should be in the advanced uh, math and the advanced biology classes. And so on an experiment, uh, unbeknownst to me, they assign me to those advanced classes and they teach differently. And they approach stuff differently, and it just hit a chord with my dyslexia and way of thinking. And I did extremely well, and those kinds of things, you know, helped me uh, end up with a with a career. So, yeah. really, kind of a strange uh, background from that standpoint. So writing was tough. Yeah, I hate that you missed Josh. He Josh is the most ADHD person I've ever met, and I've met a a lot of them. I yeah. think y'all would have really connected on that. Because, you know, trying to get in law school. Yeah. But was there anything that surprised you as you were doing research for the book? As the book became 
started coming together. I could see these unusual events that occurred in my father's life that at the time just seemed really bad uh, for him. But later on, you can see how God used these events to mold him and shape him and create him into a person that was perfectly equipped to write the Genesis flood. Two of the examples are when he was accepted into Princeton, he had uh, traveled all over the world with his uh, military parents. And like I said, he grew up in China and was you know, just fascinated by international people and those types of things. And so he went to Princeton, he decided to sign up for geology because he liked geography. And it turned out it was the people that were teaching uh, the um, paleontology and evolutionary geology. And they were actually the world's leaders in writing the textbooks. And he ended up getting thoroughly taught in the complete theory of evolution. And he was not a believer at that time. And so when he was drafted in the army after his freshman year, because they were running out of soldiers, uh, he uh, tested out of the, you know, the regular infantry because of his, his background and was put into a special program called uh, AST program. And he had the opportunity to go sort of with the diplomatic corps so that when the army comes through and captures an area, the old government is blown up and you have to have somebody there to just keep law and order and organize things. And so they had a group of people that were experts in language, in government, in administration, and who understood cultures and people. And so he was a great candidate for that. But he was a little bit short on his language requirements because he chose to take geology. So they assigned him to a uh, to, to engineering courses for a year. He hated engineering. He didn't want to go. He forced him to go against his will. And his father, who was a colonel in the U.S. Army, um, just sent him a letter and said, son, he says, I know you hate uh, uh, the... Um, you know, these types of sciences and, and uh, engineering, but sometimes a higher power has a un better understanding of where you can be best used, and they assign you this for a reason. And so be a good soldier and do the best you can and push forward. And it turned out that those two skill sets that he learned about geology, paleontology, the dinosaurs, the fossils, how, you know, stuff was laid down, and engineering principles of uh, physics and and uh, moving matter and those kinds of things were perfect for him to collaborate with Henry Morris, who happened to be a experimental scientist and author of the major textbooks on hydrodynamics, uh, and who was a, a Baptist uh, but was not a theologian. So my father could critically review and understand and help edit. Henry Morris's sections, and Henry Morris and, and uh, Henry Morris could help with my father's sections. But my father had insights into how to defend the Bible and explain the Bible and uh, to approach uh, things for, with biblical science that Henry Morris didn't have, and vice versa. But between the two of them, they truly co-wrote the Genesis flood, so that it was a unified, organized, detailed, highly uh, referenced, clear, comprehensive book that changed the world. All right. So why do you believe a good and faithful servant might be helpful to those listening? Well, I think that the there's, there's a little bit in there for everybody. And I sort of touched on, you know, there's a couple of chapters on World War II and on, you know, uh, a lot on the Princeton Evangelical Fellowship and what a good campus ministry is about. Um, and then I wrote a, a whole chapter on the impact of the Genesis flood, and that really goes into the Bible science debate. And I was able to show why it had a, such an impact in launching the young earth creation, but I was able to do it from a retrospective standpoint, since it would been out for for uh, almost 60 years, and uh, to grow up around it. But I'm a PhD experimental scientist, a principal investigator, and I know how science works. And I'm familiar with the arguments and I, you know, and good science and bad science. And I've, 
you know, attended many conferences where the evolutionary scientists try to quietly discuss why none of their models actually work. And they realize that, in fact, it's a hypothesis with no mechanism. It cannot work. It's impossible. And, and they're going, we hope there's no creationist in here because they admit that there are huge, massive experiments on artificial life, uh, which is a computer program to simulate the factors necessary to initiate life. Uh, studies on the complexity of a cell and what are the minimum requirements for a, a tiny organism. It's the same for a complex organism because it has to do all the functions of a complex organism as a single cell. And it's super complex. And the third thing is the tree of life, which shows the animals branching out from an amoeba into birds on one side and fish on the other and mammals and amphibians and everything. That should easily be easily traced by the genetic uh, artifacts that are left as each uh, branch develops, and we should be able to quickly put that back. And we know how that works in Ancestry.com. It's amazing. They can tell you you have a cousin in Iowa. (laughs) You know, it's amazing. But when they try to do that using all the different types of animals and stuff like that, what they find out is outside of a specific species, there's no connections, none. It, it's just a total failure. There is no connections. There's none. And with all the computational power to come up with a giant zero, it means that all the different species were created independently. And the similarities are because they live in the same environment and eat the same things. And each one can sort of eat off the other one. And you've got just an incredible system, but all of them were created perfectly with incredible detail. It's it's an engineering, my mind's being blown. Just in the tiny area I work on, it's mind blowing. And so I think one of the problems we have is we severely underestimate the wisdom and the power of God and his ability to communicate. Who do we think we are anyway? Right. Yeah, it seems pretty unlikely that there was a a whole era of organisms that were just cartilage. And that's why we can't find them. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I know of that has uh, four fingers and a thumb and no bones is a glove. Yeah. That's a good one. That's funny. Uh, But do you believe it's possible to have church unity with those who have different beliefs about creationism and evolutionism than you? Yes. And there, there are, but there are, there's levels of of um, cooperation that are, that uh, are occurring based on uh, some of these divisions. So you know, many of my Christian friends are evolutionists, and they, they're they frankly afraid to tell their scientific friends they're Christians because they'll be ridiculed. Well, I don't care. You know, I mean, what I'm worried about is what God's going to say with what did you do with with the truth that I gave you? That's what I'm worried about. So uh, So, yeah, it is possible. And there's other areas that there's uh, differences on, like eschatology. Some people are believe in a tribulation, some are all millennial, some, you know, so there are differences um, in in those areas as well. But what right. happens is that when true believers get together, there's a bond of unity that has where some of those things uh, can be studied and debated uh, but we're on the same side if we're born again believers and our desire is to honor God. If we're seeking the truth, we can work together with others that are seeking the truth, even though their perspectives and experiences are a little bit different. And to be honest with you, all of us, all of us are biased by our background and what we were taught and what we, you know, when you learned about Christ and became a, a believer, um, you know, the tendency is to embrace everything that that uh, church body said, where later on you're going, well, I'm not sure the Bible actually says that, or, I, you know, um, that's not really what it says. And so each of us is, is responsible to God to study his word carefully and to do it with the attitude of let's learn what God has for us Thank him for the enlightening work of the Holy Spirit to help us find the truth if we diligently seek it, and to be honest and, and follow him without 
without uh, fear. And so that's that's sort of how I, I approach this. Right. So for those unfamiliar, are you a, a young earth or an old earth creationist? Young earth. I just wanted to get that out there. Uh, so what measures can we take to do that or at least to be at peace with one another as Romans twelve eighteen commands us to be with all people? Yeah. So, you know, if there's a young earth and an old earth uh, creationist who are together, uh, they do not draw swords. They can debate uh, those things, but it's uh, a family debate and the arguments can be uh, discussed and the scriptures primarily, you know, have to be viewed very carefully. Uh, I think also approaching the scriptures with reverence and uh, intention for obedience and uh, just asking the Holy Spirit to help understand these things and not be muddled by strange arguments that are out there that uh, are really not helpful. There's a lot of people try to be intelligent, smart, and, you know, also, and, you know, just read the Bible and obey it. And I think that's the best advice. Yeah. Which version? Um, you know, I uh, recently been going to a church that's King James only, and I'm having a terrible time following it. And um, I use the uh, New American Standard. And the reason is that that's a good study Bible. I've been studying it for years and I'm familiar with it. And uh, when I try to read out of other versions of the Bible, I start inserting, I start quoting from one and trying to read the other. It's just very confusing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's the one, the one I prefer. I think that uh, there are excellent tools now so that no matter which version you're using, you can click on a word and can take you back to the Greek and all the explanations and different people's views. So, uh, I don't think that's as critical anymore, uh, but that's the one I use. Yeah, that's from, you know, the people we've had on the show. It seems like the NASB is like the theologian's edition so far, yeah, it's, at least. It's a trans, you know, it's a, it, it's almost a word for word translation. So the structure is not as readable as some of the other versions that try to capture the thoughts a little bit more. But when you do that, then you you know, you put some human subjectivity in and uh, that's always a little bit uh, dangerous. And I think that the translators that take that approach understand that have tried to be very careful to uh, keep the biases out. But uh, that's the one I use. I like the CSB. I feel, I feel like it's a good middle ground between good translation and easy to read. But we also read that you work on genetics yourself. What can you tell us about your own work? Uh, so um, I work on complex trait genetics, and I've had a fabulous career. Uh, genetics in general is uh, the idea that if somebody is born and uh, has some terrible malformation, you can go in and find out the gene that's missing that should have been there to help the development or you know, cystic fibrosis where you know there's one gene that causes it. The reality is that the vast majority of diseases, 90% of them, are uh, diseases that people get for no reason. Uh, somebody in your block has lung disease, someone else has kidney disease, someone else has hypertension, and there's not one reason why. And so if you take a statistical approach, take all the people with kidney disease on one side and people without kidney disease on the other and find the one thing that is different between them, there is no one thing, and it's just been completely frustrating, and medicine reflects that. They just, they don't, you know, you do some general things. Well, I've got a secret weapon. I believe that God created animals, and he used superb engineering designs, and that the cells of the body are actually engineered, and so if they're not working, you can use a reverse engineering approach and find out the combination of things that aren't working, just like a mechanic looking at your car. Mm -hmm. And so I picked the pancreas to work on because it's a very simple organ that has three cell types and they each do one thing. We know how it works and backed huge amounts of genetic information into that using mathematical modeling and building uh, uh, models that you could reverse engineer it and then forward simulate what's happening and figured out what the problem is. We solved the unsolvable problem that is essential for precision medicine. So it's, it's, people say, how in the world did you figure that out? 
I'm going, well, it just seemed obvious to me. You know, being dyslexic is a huge advantage because you think differently. And uh, recognizing who built it is also helpful. Yeah, it's uh, that's a big change I've seen in recent years is uh, people have started to look down on ADHD and dyslexia less because most people who are, you know, socially active, academically active, have started to realize that it's not a handicap. Uh, it's an advantage in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, you know, and many, many times it, you know, there'd be a very, so I, I ran the GI division for at the University of Pittsburgh for 17 years, and there would be just a super complex thing. And I could just look at it and immediately say, well, you know, here's the problem. If you turn everything upside down and backwards and you push this and stop that and redo, this is how it's going to work. And they're going, how did you figure that out? And I said, I don't know. I can tell you. And so you can write it down because I can't write legibly, but you know, that's, and, and they or some of the other statistics people go, you have an uncanny way of seeing what's actually going on here. And then we put it to the test. That it's right. So it's, you know, so God gave me some gifts and disabilities, but uh, I, I pray that uh, I've used them to his honor and glory uh, because that's why we're here. It's to bring honor and glory to God. And uh, I hope that um, my efforts, including writing this book about my father, who really, it's a, it's a book that's worth reading uh, because he's an unusual man of God. And to see how God used him is, I mean, I, I still look at, uh, I just, uh, my brother-in-law sent me an email today and he said, I just finished reading the book for the fourth time. And I can't tell you what a blessing it's been. Well, who reads a, a 544-page book four times and is excited every time? Man, definitely not me. It's me. But uh, where can people go to find A Good and Faithful Servant or any of your other work? Uh, so, um, well, I've got hundreds of publications in scientific literature. Uh, I just had my 300th uh, peer review paper accepted. So that's kind of a little milestone and nice. uh, another major textbook is uh, going to come out. So I've got multiple textbooks and those types of things. None of your listeners would like any of those. Um, but I have written a good and faithful servant. It's available on Amazon. It's available on the master books website. And um, I think it's on another number of other websites as well. So it's available online. And uh, like I said, the reviews have been outstanding. And I think it could really be uh, an encouragement to, to people. And if you read the views, you begin to see how other people, you know, they never heard of John Whitcomb before. But um, this one lady said, well, I'm a pastor's wife. When I read it, I knew that my husband and son need to read this book. It's been an incredible encouragement to me, and it will be to them as well. Yeah. So something I just put together um, you're the Whitcomb on my biology 101 textbook. That's crazy. That's insane. It could be. It could be. Yeah, a lot of our stuff uh, has got. So uh, we discovered uh, the gene for hereditary pancreatitis. We discovered uh, how the cystic fibrosis uh, gene secretes bicarbonate in the pancreas and why that's critical. And uh, that has implications for medicine, a lot of things like that. So, yeah, there's. It's uh, filtering down to Biology 101. Yeah, it is. Uh, I might actually need to read some of your peer-reviewed papers. Uh, but aside from that, uh, we always like to ask our guests for a single tangible action to help maintain unity in the church. What is one practical way that ordinary churchgoers listening can help maintain the unity of the whole church? Um, you know, I, I learned by the example of my father who had very deeply held beliefs and convictions that he, he stood on and he believed that that's what the Bible said and, and he could explain why. But he was a very humble and gracious man who cared about other people and was able to encourage and work with people that had very different theological backgrounds or opinions with him. Uh, obviously, he couldn't work with somebody who was attacking him and condemning him. You just, you know, that's not a, a basis for that. 
but the recognition that, you know, he had some areas where he had studied and uh, other areas where other people, you know, had made contributions as well. And although, you know, they're coming at uh, the word of God from different perspectives and contributing different ways, they were all uh, born again believers. They were looking for, you know, the, the coming of Christ and for uh, in eternity with him and, and tried to uh, encourage each other. And uh, he was so gracious. And uh, even if, if uh, people, had, when I was a kid, I thought, you know, somebody come up to him and say, Dr. Whitcomb, what about this and this? And I thought, that's the stupidest question I've ever heard. He's very gracious and he would take his time. He would explain it in a dignified way and encourage the person, ask their name and a little bit about them. And, um, just, you know, great example. And, uh, and I, I tried to capture that aspect of who he was in the book. And I think that uh, the readers see that and understand that, that he was all about God's work 24-7 and not about himself. It was how could he advance the work of Christ? And so awesome. I think if more of us had that attitude, uh, the world would be a better place. Yeah, I have to agree. So next up, we have our God moment segment, which if this is your first time listening to the show, thank you, first of all. Also, thank you for listening this far. But this is just a minute where we like to share what God's been up to with us recently, whether it's a blessing, a challenge, a moment of worship, any of those things. I always make Josh go first. Josh is not with us today, which means I have to go first. So you have as much time as you need to think about you know, what God's been up to recently. But for me personally, I would say uh, I have recently gotten a new job offer, which I might take. I'm really conflicted. I don't know. So I hope God helps me the rest of the way through and lets me know what I should do. He usually does. So I'm looking forward to what the next couple of weeks bring. But Dr. Whitcomb, do you have a God moment for us today? Oh, right now I've got a lot of things going on. Um, I am able to take um, a full retirement and retain my status at the university as an emeritus uh, endowed professor. And uh, so I'm weighing that out. I also have a biotech company that um, we've used to actually implement all of the new discoveries and approaches we've taken and a publishing company I just started as well that is going to be useful for taking just information and building it in, in multi-dimensions so that it can be read by machines accurately. Uh, so I'm working on that and debating on whether or not to uh, go back for an MBA in addition to my MD and PhD. But I'm also uh, realized that, you know, I I'm, uh, need to spend more time with my family as uh, I'm hit, hitting retirement age and I have uh, grandchildren and others that, uh, really would like more of my time as well. So trying to balance out everything has really uh, been challenging and I'm still trying to finish volume two of A Good and Faithful Servant. So I've got my plate full. I've got to make some some tough choices. And um, we're also, you know, on, um, on a ministry team at the church and trying to balance that out. And being a physician, having connections at the university is just really helpful. So people go to the right doctor the first time and, uh, you know, or just help in other ways. It's just, we're just uh, very busy and need to, need to prioritize and cut some strings. All right. Yeah. Busy, busy man. I hope I'm never that busy. Me either. <laughs> right. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it with a friend or an enemy. You can also share it with a cousin. You always have that choice. If you don't have any cousins, uh, just send it to me. I'll listen to it, I guess. Uh, you can check out our other podcast at systematicgeekology.org. Uh, support us on Patreon if you would like to listen to our Pet Peeves segment, which is just, you know, we talk about our guests, Pet Peeves, and Josh's. Josh has a ton of them. And thank you for listening to the Whole Church Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Next week, we'll be continuing our Dividing Scripture series, looking at the beasts of the Book of Job. Then we'll be interviewing Joseph Mancuso of the Full Live TV. After that, we'll be having another roundtable discussion, this time about whether or not Christians should be involved in scientific discussions. Then at the end of season one, we will have Francis Chan join us. Hopefully, he'll eventually see our email uh, that says, Hey, Francis Chan, would you like to be on our 
podcast and he'll accept. Uh, so once again, thank you all so much. Thank you, Dr. Whitcomb, for your time. And we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Whole Church Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Remember, you can always sponsor our show at patreon.com forward slash the whole church podcast for $3 a month. Please come back next week where we're going to be continuing our Dividing Scriptures series. This time we will be looking at the different beasts in the book of Job and what the different opinions on who those beasts are and why it matters.